God, everyone. I hope you're great. I hope you're doing well. I hope you are enjoying the weather here in Kampala. Everything is beautiful. The weather is good. The heat has disappeared and we are enjoying a cool breeze. I pray that you are enjoying this uh, beautiful day, an amazing Sunday God has given us. May God continue to be good and nice to us as reflected in the weather that is given us. Uh, when I read what is in the news, I continue to realize that we are not going to be facing any economic good, uh, economically good uh, benefits soon. But those who know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do great exploits. As reading the economic report from Bank of Uganda, you may need to read it and know where we stand as a nation. If you are an intercessor in this country, it's critical that you begin to intercede for God to give us wisdom in every tough situation. God makes men of wisdom to come into play and help in the situation. When God um, gave Moses instructions to construct the ark, he said he had given wisdom to particular men who would help in designing it. Uh, the situation we are faced with as a nation requires wisdom right now. We need to be able to understand that that's how God has decided and we must be strong to bless this. But like I keep saying, if you can go back to a life without debt, if you can cut down on your expenses, what is coming will be easy for you. And if you have a job and you're earning, plan to save more for the tough times ahead as opposed to spending more. If you've been a person that has a budget for leisure, you may need to save that. Again, God gives us information of what's coming ahead of time, such that we prepare, but it's in human nature that we don't. We need to get to a time when churches are going to be full. Whether you deny it, a place of solace, a place of consolation has always been the, the house of God. Though the church is you as an individual, because you are a temple of Christ, the house of God in there, out of the 100 people you will meet, even though the situation is so bad, you will at least meet 10, 10 people who will be okay, which is impossible in the places of hangout, the places of hangout you will meet people who will give you more alcohol, who will lead you into more sin. They look like they are being nice at the time, but at the end of the day, you are ushered into more addictions, more regrets. Today, there are so many channels that are on YouTube talking about life in the bath. Surely, those who are there know that it's not a good place to be, but I mean there are people who are there and they must serve them. Uh, God requires that in every decision you're doing, you do it while you're sober. Sober in mind, sober in every situation, such that you have no regrets. The church seems harsh, sometimes seems judgmental, sometimes to people who do not read the Bible. But when you read the Bible, really, in most cases, the things that we are taught are things that are true. But because they seem so difficult, because it is the word of God, when it comes to you when you're not ready, you feel like you're being judged. But as you grow in the knowledge of God, you will learn that that was not harsh 
that was not judgmental, but that was the way of God, but it came to you at a time when you're not ready. That's why you'll find that we grow in our faith, we grow, we grow in our relationship with God. So where we started, it's not where we are. It was hard to even commit to prayer. It was hard to even commit to come to the presence of God. But look at us today, those who call themselves children of God. We know that we did not come from an easy place. We have been there. We have felt judged by the believers. We have felt coerced. We have felt like being forced into something that we were not ready for. But when we got ready, the story changed. So brother and sister, uh, be encouraged. Uh, take time alone to know about God in your situation. I know that you have a personal relationship with God. I know he speaks to you. Sometimes you see things that you do not understand. Sometimes you see things that you understand, but you do not know how to overcome them. What matters? Go into the house of God. Go into the presence of God. Let us, all of us, cry to God the best way we can until something happens. We must pray until something is happens. I mean, happens. So, today, being a Sunday, God does things in mysterious ways. We are ushering into a phase where Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Jesus now accepting that the time has come, he mightily embraces it and triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. And so we are going to be reading from chapter 21, the triumphant entry of Jesus in Jerusalem. You know, walking into your destiny, however tough it will be, but you embrace the challenges that you're going to face. Uh, I want to, in, to compare this to marriage, which we were talking about yesterday. When we were younger, we saw brides being given away in marriage, and it was not an easy sight to behold. They cried, they never wanted to go, especially where I come from. And it reminds me that you know it's the good thing, you're going into it. But the thought that you're breaking free from your family, breaking away from your family, going to start a new family, getting new relatives, uh, meeting the relatives of your husband, your mother-in-law, the father-in-law, you're not sure if they will accept you, you're not sure if they are going to behave like the way you behaved in your father's house. So it comes with a lot of mixed emotions. I do not know whether today that is still the case. But you know at the end of the day that marriage is the good thing and you know you'll do it and you know it's a matter of life and death. And so uh, this is how Jesus' entry in Jerusalem is. He knew he was going to be given up. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew he was going to be crucified. He knew. But that is the sole purpose he had come here. To reconcile us back to the Father, he had to go through it. He paid the price. And so the time has come for him to pay the price. And he triumphantly enters into Jerusalem with the power and might of the Almighty God. What was going to follow was very tough. I am sure there are people who knew he was going to die and they were laughing at him. They knew you were just wasting time. But for him, he was glorifying God because the time was soon approaching. And even today, we have people who laugh at people when they go into marriage, especially those who have failed in it and those who are not even able to get their spouses. So when you're busy celebrating, they are busy cursing. That does not take away the fact that for you is a good moment. Mixed feelings of joy and sadness. I chose to explain this from that point of view, thinking that you would be able to understand it like that. Jesus, to him, this was an important journey. Death on the cross was a beautiful thing for him because then that's why he says it is finished. 
because he prepared for it he came down for it and he finally succeeded in it and so likewise today when we look at people that have been married 60 70 years together celebrating life i am sure at the end of the day they are saying we did it we did it and those who want to be successful in marriage should be able to look at those who made it not at those who failed because those who failed can only lead you into failure, but those who made it can only lead you into success. So we look at Jesus, he did it. All of us will be able to do it. Like I said, if God, Jesus sacrificed his life that he can reconcile you back to the Father, teach you how to defeat sin, teach you how to walk in the kingdom of glory. And so if you are able to do it, I'm sure those who have walked righteously with their God for 30, 40 years, they are saying, we are doing it, we are doing it. They are the ones who encourage us. And if it was not because of them, maybe the church in Uganda would have folded. I don't mind where you worship from, as long as you feel that you are connected to God and you feel that he's leading you in the right direction, keep trusting him. One day, he will bring you to a meeting place where all of us we shall be reconciled. At the end of time, that's when we shall know which faith was false and which faith was true. Again, as Christians, all that we aspire for should be eternity. If you're aspiring for eternity, God teaches you to walk in righteousness. God teaches you to connect. And that's why you find for God if the time is right, he will lead you to a place where he believes that is the place you need to be to grow. So it's not in my place to decide or judge. As long as the word of God has gone out, the Holy Spirit reserves the right to explain it to you better. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us into a place of victory where we are not misled. I could mislead without knowing but the Holy Spirit will not. Even in cases where my explanation has not started with the explanation of God, I'm sure that already in your minds he has already clarified. Uh, like I keep telling us, the tongue is one of the biggest problems that we have that we cannot control. Once something, once something has gone out, it's gone out. It takes the Holy Spirit to come and help us put our tongue right in order. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to us as we read the word of God and as we enter into this age, I will encourage us to put ourselves in the shoes of Christ, however big they are, so that we can try to understand how he felt. Always when I'm reading the Bible, this is the biggest, the, the most difficult part. From the time when I was little, every time I read, this journey of the suffering of Christ, it hurt me. I felt a lot of pain. I wondered how people would be that bad. But now that I'm older and I'm understanding better of the Lord, I just thank God that he did it. He did it for me. He did it for you. He did it for all those who believe and trust in him. Jesus is a perfect gift. If you have had a revelation of Jesus, no one can change your mindset. No one can change your mindset. You'll be happy in Christ. You'll be happy in Jesus. You will be happy in his arms. Just surrender. Let him be your God and your Lord and your Savior. And all will work out perfectly for the good of Christ and for the good of the Almighty God. So, Matthew 21, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpeth, Bethpeg, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Lose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has, has need of them, and immediately he would send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, 
Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, and fall of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their cloth on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, the Galilee, of Galilee, sorry. I need the grace of God to be able to read this word because it's a, it's a reminder of what Jesus had to go through for our sake. Comes into the city majestically, triumphantly, to just go through the pain that was awaiting him. You know, there was nothing as beautiful as knowing Christ and partaking in his goodness. Every time we take Holy Communion, we are reminded of how much he loved us and the price he paid for us. And it is his blood that we walk on, we survive on, it is his body that was destroyed for our sake. You know, loving us so much, having seen what our forefathers had gone through, had said enough is enough. Sin has to be defeated somehow. My people have to be to be well. And what it took was him to die. <clears throat> I said today, no one needs to die because Jesus already died. No one needs to die for you. Those who make people promise to die for them, no one needs to die for you. Jesus already died. Even if these people died for you, they cannot give you what Jesus gave you. Our children have been led astray because they did not or they have not been prepared to know what Jesus represents in their lives. Some of us have been able to get to today because someone laid the foundation. Yesterday when I was reading the word of God, I felt a strong admiration for my grandparents, though they did not do so much, but they did what was required to lay the false foundation. Otherwise, I would be there somewhere, putting on a sackcloth, serving the gods of our ancestors, the gods that have no life in them. Today, we have Christians that do not understand what our grandparents all great-grandparents sacrificed for Christ, for Christianity. Those who first believed are the ones who understood where they were coming from and why they needed to believe. They were suffocating in idol worship. They were shedding innocent blood to please their gods. They were selling their souls to evil. To just please their gods. They had no peace. They were tormented. They were traumatized that they had to believe. No wonder those who first believed when the enemy wanted to kill them in my home country, they said would rather die for Christ, but we are not denouncing him. That tells you how deep they understood. But here we are. We have no Christ in us, 
We don't even know how to worship ancestors. And we are just there trying to let the devil use and destroy our lives as he pleases because we do not want to honor God and honor Christ. And my little understanding really is in Christ. If you're truly in Christ, there is that peace that surpasses all understanding because he teaches you to do right things rightly and he keeps you out of the way of evil and you can sleep well at night knowing that you owe, you owe no one. You owe nothing to the devil. You can love people irrespective. And even though an enemy would come into your life to attack you, he would just change on, exp on, on encountering you because you will just have that innocence as good as that of a child. You have heard that children are humble and those who are like children, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. When God takes you to that place, where you let people take their place in your life, where you do not hold any grudge, where your heart is pure, where your heart is at peace, that is what Jesus can give. Now, Jesus is triumphantly getting into Jerusalem. People are celebrating. They do not know what they are celebrating for. Those are people are laying their cross on the floor. Others are cutting down trees and there is a lot of celebration. But Jesus in his heart, he knew his time had come. And he's happy knowing that the people that he's dying for know who he is. Those who knew, knew. And those who did, definitely didn't. And they continued and killed him. Had they known who he was, they wouldn't have killed him. The devil, their father, had blinded them. So today we have people that we actually sacrifice our lives for. But given a chance, they would want to kill us. Because they feel you interfere with their lives. They feel you're useless. They feel you do not know what you're doing. They judge you because they do not know what you're doing. In salvation, whoever accepts salvation and go through the process of repentance and breaking free, does it not for themselves, but for the loved ones. And so when you become victorious and then you take up your place as an intercessor for your family, the people that follow after you, they don't go through the same challenges that you've gone through. Because you've already broken free, you will help others to break free easily. But you will find the people that will tap into your sacrifice are the ones that the devil uses to sabotage you. And there is no battle as difficult as fighting to redeem those who fight against you. That's what happened to Jesus. He was giving up his, his life for us. But us who he was dying for are the ones who crucified him. So Jesus majestically, mightily comes into Jerusalem and the next stop is at the temple where he cleanses it. He comes, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of sea, of thieves. It is written, sorry, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, 
and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignated. They were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babies and nursing infants, you have perfect praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and the Lord and he lodged there. You know, what we call the church today is the house of prayer. The church is your body, your temple. The house of prayer is the building where the church converges where different people come together, different altars of God come together to do great and mighty things for the Lord. Because as an army of Christ, when we come together, we come into a place of victory, a place of honor, a place of power. Now, Jesus comes into the house of prayer, which Houses of prayer today are like the houses of prayer those days. They have become a market where buyers and sellers meet each other. Hold meetings, do transactions, and there is no Jesus in those transactions. May God help us so that we will be able to return to the original love. Jesus comes in Jerusalem and I'm sure that the Spirit of God took over him because he was coming where they were going to kill him and he came in power and he scattered businesses of people in the house of God. He made enemies towards his victory, towards his death because to him death for us was victory on the cross. Now, today, you must know that if you want victory as a child of God, you will come to a place where you will make enemies. Those who survived on enslaving you will be your enemies. Those who exchanged your blessings, those who made you naked, every power that stood in the way for you, will come up against you. They will not be happy. Those who have been working on your blessing, those who has put, have put you to shame, as God is taking you to the place of redemption, they will stand against you. Jesus makes enemies in Jerusalem enough to kill him. And so his preaching changes in Jerusalem. So the next thing we see, the fig tree withered. So in the morning, as he returned to the city and he was hungry, he passed by a fig tree, which was by the roadside. He couldn't find, he could find nothing to eat. And so he cast the fig tree. And the next morning, when they were passing, the apostles with him, they found the fig tree had, had, dried up and so they asked that when the apostles saw it they were marveled and so they asked how did the fig tree wither so soon and jesus answered to them and he said assuredly to you if you have faith and do not doubt you will not only do what was done to the fig tree but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast out into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believe you will receive. This is the second time Jesus is talking about uh, faith enabling you to order, to command something and it is moved. Command the mountain and it is, it obeys. What we need as children of God is the faith we must have in Christ that he, in his name, every knee bows. Jesus 
put the power on his name with his tongue before he was given up. Remember, Jesus is the word. So he understands the power of the word. And he spoke all the words that were powerful. That's why I told you that when we read the gospel, every word is powerful. He put power on his word. He confessed it and it became life. And those who understand the power of confession and the power of the word, bearing that it is the word himself speaking the word, Every word Jesus says is life in itself. You see how we have transformed from the Old Testament to the New Testament? The New Testament is the law itself at play. Do this, do that, do this, do that. We are being taught how to walk in Christ and become victors. Like Christ was an overcomer vis-a-vis -vis the people in the Old Testament that did not have this gift. So after the coming of Jesus Christ, life takes a new shape. But that does not mean we forget what was there before Christ. Because what was there before Christ shows how we fall. And with Christ, he shows us how we stand and overcome. Jesus shows us how to defeat the enemy. We need faith in Christ. We need to be strong in the Lord. We need to fight, be connected. We are coming to a time where you will not find enough in the house of prayer. But you, the church of God, the temple, you will find what is enough in reading the word. Reading the word boosts your faith. Reading the word teaches you how to walk righteously. He shows you the areas, the elements of righteousness that you must be able to tap into and guard against the evil that will lead you to destruction. Remember, the enemy is always waiting for you to slumber a little bit. By the time you wake up, he will have taken you many miles back. And for you to come back on your feet, it's not going to be easy. So, uh, Jesus, uh, his authority is questioned. Of course, he's come with so much power into Jerusalem. He has scattered the, the, the businessmen in church. He has uh, cast the fig tree, the way he preaches. And so people are asking questions. Why? Because the time is coming close, so the enemy is looking for the legal ground. And Jesus is giving him all justifications for the devil to come out strongly and do what Jesus wanted. Jesus wanted the devil to touch him and kill him. That way, he was going to get into the ring of spirit to fight and defeat him because the war does not end here when Jesus dies on the cross it gets into the spiritual realm Jesus first as a human being was below the spiritual creatures in death he became level with the spiritual creatures and in in, in uh, resurrection he became an authority above the spiritual scripts uh, futures uh, uh, he creatures sorry he would only defeat the devil as a spirit not as man or as man he was able to defeat sin and show man an example then uh hang on the cross as a sacrifice a sacrificial lamb where his blood flowed and his blood cleanses us from any iniquity when we come to Christ and we repent and we turn completely. Repenting is one thing, but turning completely is the in thing, is the real thing. Turn completely with the help of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you and there will be no sin. God will forget every sin before you came to him as long as you turn completely from sin and you're not able to turn on your own you can only turn with the help of the holy spirit so jesus now his authority is being questioned in verse 23 
Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask one thing, which, if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude. For our account, John, for all, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, We do not know. And when, and he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <sighs> you know, we have people that cons consult which doctors. And when such people go to witchcraft to attack us, the witch doctors never tell them that the person you're trying to attack is prayerful. They are ashamed to admit that prayer heals, that prayer is powerful. One day, I was watching TV, and there is a popular uh, witch in Uganda who was on national TV making fun of the Pentecost of the born again, saying they shout Jesus, they are in church shouting, but I've taken a long time without hearing these people talk anymore. Brethren, the power of prayer the witches don't want to admit because they know it is powerful, but because they do not want to lose their clients, they lie to them that this person is consulting a higher power. So you will find most people who go into witchcraft when they meet born again, who are really born again, they say these people are witches because their witches told them that you consult a higher witch. So don't be surprised a Christian who trusts completely in your God, you hear people saying that you're a higher witch. That indicates that you have a higher power protecting you and the enemy cannot do anything to you. All you need to do is to keep connected to Christ. A time is going to come when our nation, Uganda, everyone will know the power that God uh, possesses and people will be able to live in a country that God has decided to protect mightily. There are so many things that God does for our nation without knowing, but you wonder why Uganda, we are the way we are, because I strongly believe that our nation has decided to put God first and even the one who came up with the national anthem, I do not know how strong his faith was, but God worked through him and he gave us a nation that puts God, as, as an anthem that puts God first in every situation. And so uh, we have Jesus whose authority cannot be questioned. Those who tried to question it were even so intimidated by him. And yes, we know people who question our level of faith. People look at the way, uh, the challenges we encounter and they want to judge us, but they fear us in their hearts. They want to be like us, but they can't. There is no one who does not want to be with like someone who can sleep well at night when the world is in a mess. Uh, people who know their God, remember they shall be strong and they shall do great exploits. So the scribes and Pharisees asked questions, the authority of Jesus. They knew when Jesus asked them a question of where John the Baptist picked his authority, they were scared of saying the truth. They knew the truth, was, but they were scared of saying it because they were scared of their master the devil. They could not admit the truth. And today we have so many people who know the truth. Even the witches, they know the truth but they are scared to pronounce it because of their master. But the time is going to come when there will be no witchcraft found in Uganda because God wants those people in Uganda, everyone from the ends of the earth, to know him and serve him. And he himself will minister to these people through the, the 
people he has chosen and people will come to Christ. And a time is going to come that Uganda will be totally his and his mighty power will be revealed. So fine, uh, we also look at the parable of the two sons. And so what about, but what do you think? A man who had two sons and had come to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard and answered and, and said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said to him the first. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and heralds enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and heralds believed him, and when they saw it, you you did not afterwards relent and believe him. It's important. What matters is doing the will of God. We have so many people. I go through the same challenges today. I say I want to fast. And you do two days and on the third day you fail. And someone who does not even say it does it and manages to finish through. Such people break through faster than those like us who say and we do not do. What matters is not you saying that you will do, but you doing the will of God. Sometimes it looks so hard, but when we make an effort, it works out. Maybe the first son who said no, he wasn't sure he would do it. But afterwards he tried and he saw it was possible. And yet someone who thinks it is easy, they keep postponing it until nothing happens and they find themselves in a place of great shame upon failure. It's important what matters to God is doing, not promising to do and we don't do. And so uh, the word of God also, uh, I mean Jesus talks about also the parable of the wicked vine dressers. Here another parable, there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and sent a hedge around it, dug a wine place in it and built a tower and he leased it to the vine dressers who went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers but the, they, that they might receive its fruits. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They say to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers, who will render to him the fruits in the season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of heaven will be taken from you and given to the nation bearing the fruits of it, and whoever falls in the on the cornerstone will be broken, but whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, the, now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard these parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they thought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they, taught, they took him for a prophet. The, prof, the, the parable of the wicked vine dressers, to me, I understand it as Jesus being the son of God who would be killed, who came after the various men and women of God that God had sent the prophets prior 
in the Old Testament that were killed. Many prophets talked about God and, Jesus, and, and the kingdom and they were killed. They prophesied of the things that would come and most of them were killed. And so finally God said, let me send my son. I know they will know that he's my son and they will not touch him. But Jesus is talking of what they were about to do to him. They were about to kill him thinking they would take his inheritance. Little did they know that he was God himself in flesh and he knew their thoughts and so he planned right ahead and led them to fall into their trap. They rejected him as a cornerstone and yet he was the strongest pillar of support for the work they were building. And so it is important that we understand and not be like those who killed he that was out to redeem them. The parable, the parables, the power in the parables reveal the great mysteries in the kingdom of God. And Jesus, talking of this parable, talks about himself. And now, in chapter 22, he also talks about the parable of the wedding feast. Now, this is a parable that all of us, I think, must know. A rich man that prepared a wedding for powerful people, kings and queens, the mighty. And then when the, the party was ready, the banquet was ready, uh, no one came of the invited. And so the master sent his servants to go on the streets, comb the streets, comb the people, the area, and bring people that were initially uninvited. To the, to the table and when they had managed to bring all that they brought among them came those who were not dressed those who were lame and so he sorted those who had been brought and he cast those ones out what I learned from this parable is that Christ came or God came to be ushered his target first was for the educated, the rich, the kings, and the mighty. Those who had an understanding, who had given wisdom to understand and know him. Unfortunately, these rejected him. And so when they rejected him, he opened a door for those that were not worthy to come into his presence. But even those who were not worthy, he sorted. And also, if I could also make it sound like this, that Jesus initially had come for the Jews and those who were considered children of God, they would easily understand God. But when Jesus came, they rejected him. And so when they rejected him, they gave an opening for us, the Gentiles, who were not even worthy to come into his places, because in his places, because previously we had other gods that we used to worship. And so he opened the door for us. But even among us, the Gentiles, he still sought, he doesn't take everything. That's why we see we have those that have chosen to reject him and also stay in worshipping traditionally like they did worship. Hear this. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to his to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There you will be weeping and garnishing to teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. God called all of us, the Gentiles, but few are chosen. It's important that we take note of the parables. They talk about the kingdom. I keep saying it, I tapped into it, tap into it, and be saved. The Pharisees. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? So Jesus now is in the hands of the enemy. He's devising all means to try and kill him, find any fault in him. Jesus would not be found with any fault. Brethren, when you accept salvation, you know the enemy will come to test you. 
Make sure like Jesus, the enemy does not find any fault in you. Turn and don't fall. Don't be enslaved. And then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might enter, entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. They are so persuasive in their nature when they try to tempt you. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regret, regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They say to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. When I'm reading this uh, message, I'm reminded of the temptations and trials you go through when you accept salvation. Like I said, the devil will always be knocking at your door. And the way he knocks is exactly to the way these uh, Pharisees and scribes would, would come to Jesus. They always come up with something. You must be alert. You must be alert such that they will not find any fault on you. And so, they come and trick you into sin. When you fall, they've got you. Jesus was tempted so many times, but every temptation that came to him, he defeated the devil. From the time when he was ushered into ministry up to the end, we do not find any fault. So the devil comes and tests you. If he finds you alert, he coils himself and goes away. Otherwise, you fall and he's gotten you in a place where he wants you. The Sadducees are what about the resurrection? And so um, these guys talk about uh, what is in the Old Testament where Jesus says, that um, you know how the sons of Judah died, those who had all married, the first one married, um, the wife died without having children with her, Tamara, and the second one uh, refused to have children with her, and so God killed him. And the third one, Tamara, Judah sent Tamara back home because he, the third one was very young and he was scared that the young, the young one would die. And so in the Old Testament, if your, a son died before having children with his wife, the brother would t inherit the wife. And so they're asking, if all the sons, all the brothers inherit the, womb, the widow and no one has a child with her and in resurrection, whose wife will be the true, I mean, whose husband would be the true husband? Because all the boys, all the brothers will have had an encounter with the woman. And so Jesus said that they are mistaken for knowing the, not knowing the scripture, know the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry or give in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Again, the secrets of the kingdom in this scripture. Jesus 
God is not a God of the living, but the God of the dead. And that's why Jesus says there is no relationship between the living and the dead. <clears throat> then the scribes, which is the first commandment. Of course, they are putting him to test. And so, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. <laughs> they were always, our enemies are always gathering, planning against us. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commands hang all the law and prophets. Again, you will realize that if you keep these two commandments, you have kept all. Because all the commandments God has given us can be found in this. You have love, you cannot break the law. Jesus, how can David call his descendants Lord? While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? whose son is here. They say to him, the son of David, he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to, the, to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no, and no one was able to answer him a word. Nor was that day, nor no, from that day did anyone dare question him anymore. Praise God, brothers and sisters. Jesus was pushed to a point of sinning, but no amount of pushing were able to fall. Jesus, no amount of pushing was able to bring Jesus to sin. It's important, brethren, that we take note of the word of God. And as we come to the conclusion of the sharing for today, you know very well that as you walk into your gate of deliverance, your gate of breakthrough, the temptation by the enemy to try and lead you astray will be very strong. You know the things that you are being delivered from. You must never fall. You must not allow the devil to open any door. Like Jesus was able to defeat the enemy by not falling short, he remained sinless. He remained stainless. May we remain sinless and stainless, filled with the abundance of the Lord and the Christ in us. And when he does all that, let all the honor and glory be given back to him. Until tomorrow when we meet again, it's been an amazing day. Please share, like, comment, advise until we walk to a place of victory together. Until tomorrow, may God bless you. Have a good day and bye-bye.